type 2 diabetes mellitus. And as you are all aware, type 2 diabetes mellitus is nothing but a chronic progressive metabolic condition or disorder due to hyperglycemia. And by the time it is diagnosed, almost 50% of the patient are already having some sort of diabetes related complication. And of course, the main care, main aim of the treatment is to prevent the development of diabetes related complication and provide them a, a better lifestyle and quality of life. Right. So let's talk about how the diabetes is develops. So as you are all aware, it is all because of the glucose remaining in the circulation causing hyperglycemia. So let's think of diabetes as a key and door lock, door lock situation. If you see this is the a normal body cell and it has glucose channel or pores on, the, on their surface. And in the presence of insulin, this channel or the door lock is opened and allows glucose to enter into the body cell to be used as fuel for their metabolic activity. In type 2 diabetes mellitus, sorry, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, the insulin is not there, so there is no key. That's why the ports are not open and glucose cannot enter into the body cells. While in case of type 2 diabetes mellitus, either the insulin, which is the key, is unable to open the door lock of the glucose channel because they are not properly or strongly created or the insulin, the key is there, but the door lock is faulty and is not working properly. Right, so it is basically a chronic condition as I mentioned and it occurs when target tissues stop responding to the insulin produced, which is basically nothing but peripheral insulin resistance and body cells are resistant to the mm -hmm. effect of the insulin or the pancreas is faulty, not able to produce enough amount of insulin resulting in insulin deficiency and thereby insulin channels the glucose channels are not open properly, resulting into hyperglycemia. So as I mentioned, the insulin resistance is one of the major factors in the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. And body sees insulin resistance as insulin deficient state. Therefore, the pancreas work more harder to create more insulin in order to combat the effect of the insulin resistance, thereby resulting in hyperinsulinemia. And in doing so, pancreas, beta cells of the pancreas, they work very hard and slowly and gradually become exhausted and insulin secretion reduces further. But the green one is basically when the insulin levels are enough for the body requirement, then it becomes amber and gradually red. And when it is red, it means pancreas is hardly able to create any insulin. And now patient needs exogenous insulin support to treat the hyperglycemia. Right. So as I mentioned in the beginning, Type 2 diabetes mellitus patient, basically they have developed diabetes-related complication. Even at the time, 50% can develop diabetes-related complication at the time of diagnosis. So these patients basically have lots of multiple comorbidities 
because of the diabetes and diabetes is usually considered to be mother of diseases affecting almost every organ of the body. So these patients basically they tend to suffer in silence and they can get depressed and need a lot of support to look after them effectively. The healthcare professionals need to be very empathetic and supportive in looking after these patients. And provide holistic care as much as can be done for the patient. So in order to provide effective management, in order to develop effective management plan for the patient, the healthcare professional need to assess the patient very in detail, looking into their personal issues, socioeconomic, religious beliefs, and of course the biomedical context is also important. Of course, we need to respect their values and belief and look into what sort of beliefs or values they have. For example, if the patient is needle phobic or thinks cannot have injections because for religious reasons, we have to respect that and of course provide supportive alternative care to the patients. We need to look into every option offered to the patient, looking into their benefits, the side effects. Of course, cost is important in third world and developing countries and any inconvenience caused to the patient due to the treatment. Right. So let's talk about how the diabetes mellitus progresses. We have briefly discussed that in the other slide. So let's talk about the pre-diabetes and the over-diabetes. The pre-diabetes is or the metabolic state developed at least 15, 10 to 15 years prior to development of over-diabetes. Over and initially, when the beta cell function is start deteriorating, the body is unable to handle the postprandial glucose surge due to food and postprandial hyperglycemia develops. Over the course of time, when the overdiabetes is, is diagnosed, the fasting glucose level start increasing as such. And of course, other complication develops. We have discussed insulin resistance in detail and the role of beta cell function over the course of time and if you have a look this this we have i mentioned about an incretin effect which is one of the most important factor in the development of diabetes incretin are peptides which are released from the gut mucosa in response to the food intake resulting in glucose surge and over the course of time, because of the hyperglycemic state, the gut mucosa become more faulty and they are unable to create enough incretin hormonal peptide, which in turn stimulate the release of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. And because of that, the, there is development of the microvascular and microvascular complications. And of course, it has affects patient very badly. So in order to provide appropriate glycemic targets, we have to assess the patient holistically, looking into patient's profile. Most of the patients need glycemic target to be under seven, usually between 6.5, to seven HbA1c targets. Younger patients who been diagnosed recently and having relatively shorter disease duration, having longer life expectancy with hardly any diabetes related complication. We need to provide more stringent control 
and HbA1c target should be between 6 to 6.5, while those patients who are diagnosed, who have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes colitis long enough, and they are elderly, they have limited life expectancy, they have multiple comorbidities, their target need to be relaxed in order to provide them good quality of life. Hyperglycemic state is associated with increased risk of complication, mainly cardiovascular related. And my, when microvasculature of the body is affected, then patients start developing diabetes related retinopathy. The kidneys are affected, mm -hmm. resulting in albuminuria and nephropathy, and of course, diabetes related nephropathy. Neuropathy is also developed over the course of time. The macrovascular complications mainly affect the medium and larger arteries, mainly the coronary circulation as well as carotids, resulting in ischemic heart disease, ischemic strokes, and patient may also have diabetes-related cardiomyopathy resulting in heart failure. Diabetic patients are very prone to develop non-vascular-related complications as well. They are more prone to develop various types of cancers. <clears throat> they have increased propensity to develop infection and sepsis, and doctors need to be very vigilant in looking into that and treating very effectively. These patients are also prone to develop neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, and mental health issues. And of course, it, we need to provide appropriate care for all these complications. So how we are going to look after the patient? Of course, uh, we have to address complication, but uh, how we are going to look into that is very important. So rather than being glycemic centric or glucocentric, we need to provide holistic care. And the goal of care is to prevent or reduce the development of diabetes related complications and provide optimal quality of life to the patient and make them as, as comfortable and as independent as possible. So this is the decision cycle for the patient-centered care, which we are supposed to provide. We need to assess the key patient characteristic, which I have discussed before, and looking into a specific patient factor. For example, if the patient's profession is drive for living or dealing with heavy machineries, then certain medications may not be appropriate for the patient, which can cause hypoglycemia and increases the risk of accident to patients and, of course, people around them. We need to discuss every aspect of the management plan and share the pros and cons of the treatment plan to the patient and make them comfortable by agreeing the management plan the management plan need to be implemented by, by having a multidisciplinary approach for role of pharmacists, dietitians, diabetes nurses, and podiatrists are very, very important in looking after the patient. And this support need to be on a regular basis so that patient don't feel isolated and feel that somebody is there to help when they need someone. So re regular monitoring of the patient is very, very important. Patient need to be reviewed frequently when they are diagnosed diabetes and till the time the appropriate glycemic control is achieved according to the patient profile. And it need to be almost on three to six monthly basis till the time treatment is optimized and then perhaps every six to one year and each review if there is any amendment in the management plan then of course patient need to be 
involved and they need to agree to the plan. Right, so the treatment plan basically uh, need to be non-pharmacological and pharmacological aspect. When it comes to non-pharmacological, we have to provide patient advice on exercise and diet control. And the recommendations are that patient need to exercise at least 30 minutes every day in order to remain fit and healthy and reduce some weight. Of course, five healthy portions of fruits and vegetables are important. And of course, dietitians are the best people to advise on them. This is a very good cycle of basically explaining various pathophysiological defects in the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. The concept is basically it is a pancreas related issue, but in fact, it affects various body organs. There's a very famous and senior diabetologist in Dallas. He is professor of diabetology, Dr. De Frenze. I managed to meet him a couple of years ago in one of the diabetes conferences in, in Europe. He's a wonderful chap in mid 70s, but very effective and very active in looking after the patient. And of course, he's still research. So basically, he provided this eight pathophysiological issues result affecting the pathology of diabetes and is called ominous octate. Beside pancreas, he mentioned that the there is neuro, neurotransmitter dysfunction in the hypothalamus affecting the satiety center and patient tend to eat more and feel hungry. The guts are involved and there is decrease in creatine peptide secretion, thereby reduction in the insulin release. Liver is one of the most important organ beside pancreas. And because of the hyperglycemia, there is increased hepatic glucose production in contributing to the hyperglycemia. In the muscles, there is reduce glucose uptake due to insulin resistance. And of course, hyperglycemia again getting worse. Kidneys play a lot of role in increasing the glucose reabsorption from the kidney nephrons. Again, having same effect. And adipose tissue, there is accelerated lipolysis resulting in free fatty, free fatty acid in the circulation and increased per propensity to develop diabetes ketoacidosis. So when it comes to the pharmacological management of the patient, we have to look into various pathophysiological effects causing hyperglycemia in a particular patient and initiate medications which can address multiple pathophysiological effects rather than only pancreas. So these are few most commonly used anti-diabetic agents, the GLP-1 GLP receptor agonists, DP4 inhibitors. These two are basically acting through the incretin effect and SGLT2 inhibitors, which mainly act on kidneys, ureas, and bigonates. Let's briefly talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists. They are by far the most effective pharmacological agent in the management of diabetes. Besides pancreas, they act on hypothalamus, suppressing the satiety center, and patients tend to feel less hungry and eat less. They promote the release of incretin hormones, which we will discuss further later on and of course the incretin then stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas. They suppress the 
gluconeogenesis in the liver and promote the glucose uptake into the muscular and the muscle cells and they suppress the glucose reabsorption to some extent in the kidneys but not fully they suppress the adipose tissue lipolysis thereby holistically they provide one of the most important pharmacological management of these patients the dpp4 inhibitor we will discuss it more in detail affect mainly the pancreas suppressing the glucagon release and increasing the insulin secretion SGLT2 inhibitors basically they are sodium glucose transport channels in kidneys and SGLT2 inhibitors block the glucose reabsorption in the kidneys and patient tend to pass glucose into the urine thereby causing thereby looking after the hyperglycemia right so let's talk about the sulfonyl urea which is by far one of the most commonly used medication in the third world countries and they affect mainly on the pancreas and bigonates or the insulin is being used for the last more than maybe 50 years and by far the, the number one drug in the management of diabetes. They mainly affect the liver, suppressing the glucoco, hepatic glucose production, but they also have few effect. And we will discuss some of these agents with more in detail. Right, so let's talk about the metformin which is being used for the last maybe more than 50 years. And they are very effective medication and gold standard in type 2 diabetes mellitus. And it can be used in few type 1 patients as well, depending on their profile. They suppress the glucose production from the liver. And they also consider to be cardiovascular friendly, reduce the risk to some extent. They help in the base reduction as well and reduce the insulin resistance to some extent. They hardly cause any hypoglycemia. It's used as monotherapy and we are very cheap to they are very cheap to buy. They can cause some gastrointestinal side effects causing bloating and stomach cramps and at time diarrhea. So the recommendation is for them to be initiated at a very lower dose and so we up the dose so that the patient can tolerate the symptoms. And they are very, very efficacious in controlling the glycemia. The sulfonyl urea, as I mentioned, is one of the cheapest medication being used very frequently in third world countries and very rarely now in Western world. They increase the insulin secretion by promoting the beta cells of the pancreas. They have been they are being used for the last many years. <clears throat> the diabetes, the UK prospective diabetic study, which is ongoing for the last 50 years, has confirmed that they can reduce the microvascular risk in diabetic patient to some extent. The major side effect or adverse effect is hypoglycemia. So it cannot be used on those patients who work hard for living or drive or use heavy machinery. Patients tend to put some weight and this is one of the important factors because when they tend to put weight, basically, despite the fact insulin production is increased, weight on its own can cause hyperglycemia. And of course, uh, we need to look into that. Their cardiovascular safety profile is uh, quite uncertain. Recently, some data has come up from Korea and other Southeast Asian countries that those patients who are having established ischemic heart disease, their 
coronary circulation can be compromised. So that need to be looked into. Right. Uh, this is uh, another group of medication, T TZD or thiozolidone dion, and only one Pyoglutin, pyoglitazone is the only medication from this group. It is recommended to use in those patients who have insulin resistance. They stimulate the insulin sensitivity in liver and muscle cells, thereby increasing glucose entry into the muscle tissues. They hardly cause any hypoglycemia and they are very durable in their mechanism of protection. They tend to increase the good cholesterol, HDL, and reduce the triglycerides. And ischemic heart disease and stroke is tend to be less in patient using bioglitazone. The only issue is they tend to create a state of fluid overload, increasing weight, causing edema and tend to precipitate heart failure in patients who are prone to that. It can cause osteoporosis resulting in bone fracture, especially in postmenopausal women, and can cause hip fracture in them. So we need to be very careful when it comes to treating elderly care population. There is some risk of patient developing bladder cancer and macular edema, but it's very rare. During my 30 years of practice as physician and diabetologist, I've come across only one patient by now. It is considered to be very gaseous and good medication in selective group of patients. So let's go back to uh, medical school time and discuss some physiology of the kidney. So this is the nephron and whatever glucose is presented to the nephron, the glomerulus, almost all of them is reabsorbed in the tubules and hardly any glucose is excreted in the urine. And most of the uh, glucose is reabsorbed through the sodium glucose transport channels in the proximal tubules 90% being SGLT2 and SGLT2 inhibitors mainly block the SGLT2 receptors and thereby doesn't allow reabsorption of the glucose and the glucose is excreted into the urine thereby producing, sorry, thereby causing sugar levels to go, to go down. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about it. So there is, it acts very noble way. There is, doesn't cause any hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia because it, it first in a glucose dependent manner, whatever glucose is basically is there, the tent glucose is being not reabsorbed and excreted in the urine. Because patients are losing calories in the form of glucose in urine, so they tend to lose weight and it is one of the medication which sometimes can be considered to be weight lowering medication as well, but mainly reserved for type two diabetes patients. It can cause modest reduction in the blood pressure, almost two to four millimeters of mercury in patients. They are very effective in all stages of type 2 diabetes mellitus. But few of the agents, those need to be reduced in when patient has chronic kidney impairment. They are considered to be CVD friendly and they <clears throat> effectively reduce the major adverse cardiovascular events in patients, they are now being considered to be used for heart failure and chronic kidney disease, even in non-diabetic patients. 
their major side effects is genitourinary infection. And if the patient are very meticulous in the personal hygiene, then it can be, it, incidence can be reduced. They tend to cause polyuria because of the diuretic effect of glucose secretion and patient can be hypovolemic and advised to drink more fluids. I'm very mindful of time. There are so many things to discuss in very short duration of time, so I will be very quick now. Let's talk about the incretin based options. So I have mentioned that incretins are hormones which are released from the gut mucosa in, in response to glucose release in the stomach. And there are two types of medication, GLP-1 receptor agonists, which is called incre incretin mimetics, or DPP-4 inhibitors, which are incretin enhancer. Right, let's briefly discuss what is what the incretins do in the system. So this is a normal healthy person in response to the food and the glucose release in the stomach. The incretin hormones are released into the circulation and they tend to last in circulation for almost three hours. They stimulate the pancreas to release insulin into the system, thereby tackling the hyperglycemia created by the food, mainly the, and both fasting as well as postperindial. While in diabetic patient, if you see the incretin response is blunted, it's not as heightened as in normal person and the duration is also short life. Therefore, insulin is release stimulation by the uh, incretin hormones are less in type 2 diabetic patients. Right, so how they work? They are released from the insulin and they the glucose, there are two hormones which are, which is GLP-1 glucose-like peptides as well as glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptides. So these are two hormones released from the intestine, GLP-1 and GIPs. So GLP-1 act on the receptors in the stomach and they slow down the gastric emptying and patients tend to eat less. They stimulate the satiety center in the hypothalamus and appetite is suppressed. In pancreas, they promote the release of insulin and suppress the release of glucagon. When the glucagon is released into the circulation, after some time, the DPP-4 enzyme degrade them into inactive form and over the course of a couple of, couple of hours, they are not there in the mm -hmm. system. While the GLP-1 receptor agonist, they tend to resist the effect of the DPP-4 inhibitors and do not degrade and remain in the circulation for longer duration of period. They effectively suppress the gastric emptying, patient feel full, their appetite is suppressed. So both ways, patients tend to eat less and glucose surge is minimized. In pancreas, they stimulate the release of insulin. Right. So we have discussed the primary physiology of their action. They hardly cause any hypoglycemia because they, they, their mechanic, mechanism of action is... Sorry, I'm talking about the DPP-4 inhibitor right now. There is hardly any hypoglycemia. They are weight neutral. They provide the physiological response of the GLP-1 on the system. They are very well tolerated and their side effects are very, very rare. And they are considered to be intermediate in their effect, providing, sorry, providing almost 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.8% reduction in the HbA1c. GLP-1 receptor agonists are, as I mentioned earlier, wonderful group of, sorry, 
medication and I have discussed their mechanism of action in detail before. Right. So let's talk about the uh, renal profile of various medication which we prescribe for the patient. So metformin, as I mentioned earlier, is being used for the last many decades and they are one of the best medication and it's still gold standard. They are well tolerated if the patient is not having any renal compromise. When the patient develops chronic renal impairment and the EGFR is under 45, then we have to reduce the dose to 50%. And if the patient develops TKD3B and the EGFR is less than 30, then we have to stop the medication because of the issues related to the kidneys and lactic acidosis. The sulfonylurea, the glycolidride, there is no dose adjustment till the CKD3A and if the, sorry, 3B, and if the, as the, if the EGFR reduces under 30, then we have to stop the medication. The PP4 inhibitors, their dose need to be adjusted when, when we use cetagliptin or elogliptin, we need to reduce their dose when the patient is having EGFR less than 50. Venagliptin, one of the DP4 inhibitor, is basically you have to just start and forget about the medication as no kidney compromise is there and no adjustment is needed. Similarly, with the depagluflozin, which is the SGLT2 inhibitor, you don't need to be worried about those adjustment because they are considered to be renal friendly, but their use need to be careful when the patient reaches stage CKD stage five or EGFR under 50. Other SGLT2 inhibitors, for example, canagluflozin or empagluflozin, their dose need to be adjusted. Then last but not the least, the GLP-1 receptor agonist. The currently dolaglutide, linaglutide, and liraglutide, and semaglutide are being used, and they are very safe till the time patient develops. And stage kidney failure and EGFR is less than 50. Right, so how we are, uh, as I mentioned that, you know, uh, diabetic patients, they, oh gosh, sorry one minute. So, diabetic patients are very prone to develop CVD-related complications, and we have to be very vigilant in looking after that. This is Tino trial was done in uh, Europe, mainly in, the, in Denmark, and they look into early intensification of diabetes treatment in patients to provide vascular protection and global risk reduction. They noted that by providing intensive treatment early on in the course of diabetic management, they, the risk reduction is very, very powerful. And they recommended the use of, they recommended few guidelines. And it is basically, it is mentioned as mnemonics A, B, C, D, E. The A is HbA1c and the optimal glycemic control for individualized treatment should be in 6.5 to 7, which I mentioned earlier. Effective blood, blood pressure control is needed to provide cardiovascular protection and look after the kidneys and it need to be under 130 by 80 by whatever means you want patient to be treated. So cholesterol level need to be addressed and LDL levels need to be under 1.8. We need to prescribe medication which tend to protect the heart as well as kidneys. So AC inhibitors or ARB 
receptor blockers are recommended to use even in patients who are normotensive. Of course, the statins are one of the main stay of treatment and aspirin need to be used in those patients who have already established cardiovascular events. Exercise and eating healthy is one of the most important thing and of course, the smoking cessation. Sorry, I'm running short of time now. I'm quite mindful, so I think I need to just get rid of some of the slides. Right. Let's talk about the various international guidelines which advise on how to look after the patient and prevent their complications. So the, the primary care diabetes Europe guidelines were published last year in March 2022, and they basically became the mainstay of the diabetic treatment to prevent the CVD patients currently. They advise looking into the risk, is cardiovascular risk stratification of the patients, and they have provided few guidelines. They consider very diabetic patient to be very high risk if they have history of established CVD or they have multiple uncontrolled CVD risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, smoking, or their lifestyle is sedentary. If the patient is having renal compromise, they are also considered to be very high risk, including hyper including albuminuria. And if the patient is diagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus at a younger age group. All other patients, including elderly patients, are considered to be high CVD risk. So the recommendation is to initiate metformin from the outset and inst instead of increasing the medications stepwise, they recommend to use SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonist or DPP-4 inhibitor from the outset in order to combat the high cardiovascular risk in these patients. And of course, metformin is gold standard. SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists should be used if the cost is not an issue. And if we are using the SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists, then the agent need to be having proven cardiovascular benefits. We can use newer sulfonyl ureas or glenides if the cost is an issue, especially in third world or developing countries, then the newer sulfonyl ureas, for example, gilclazide, can be used. Pyglitazone is recommended in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and where the insulin resistance is the issue. They, recommended the, they recommend the use of insulin only when all the ex, all the other therapies have been explored and exhausted and glycemic control is still not met appropriately. So for those patients who already have established atherosclerotic heart disease, they recommended the use of SGLT2 receptor inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor agonist from the outset. In those patients who are having type 2 diabetes mellitus along with heart failure, they recommended the use of SGLT2 inhibitors from the outset along with metformin because they are the recent trials had confirmed that they are very effective in improving the heart function and looking after the heart failure. And this group of medication, the SLT2 inhibitors, they are now being recommended to use even in non-diabetic patients 
for heart failure and chronic kidney disease. Yeah, this is another very important uh, international guidelines. This is basically mission statement from the uh, consortium consisting of American Diabetic Association and European Association of Study of Diabetes. And they basically provide position statement every year looking into various aspects of diabetes management. So they advise looking into patient profile and features. If the, the most stringent, more strict diabetes control is recommended for those patients who doesn't have any potential risk of developing hypoglycemia, they, they, they are recently diagnosed as diabetes mellitus, having long life expectancy. They doesn't have any comorbidities. In this group of patients, the diabetes control need to be quite stringent and quite aggressive. While elderly patients with who were diagnosed diabetes mellitus long ago, and their life expectancy is less and having multiple comorbidities, they should be having less stringent and relaxed diabetes control. Right, so this is a very important recommendation, which is basically the mainstay of diabetes treatment internationally. So the mission statement says that diabetes need to be any patient who are diagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus, the first line treatment is metformin. And of course, the comprehensive lifestyle advice has to be there from the outset. In order to avoid the clinical inertia, we need to reassess the patient every three to six months till the treatment is optimized appropriately. And we need to risk stratify the patients looking into whether they are high risk or having already established cardiovascular diseases or heart failure or chronic kidney disease. Those patients who are having atherosclerotic disease and their indicators of high ACVD risk is there for those patients who are Elderly age, more than 55 years, they have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary parotid or lower extremity arterial stenosis, more than 30%. In this group of patients, we need to be more vigilant and treat accordingly. Those patients who have heart failure or CKD, then of course we need to look after them differently. So they recommend the use of metformin and they advise adding SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists like the Primary Care Diabetes Society guidelines in order to prevent the CVD risk. Those patients who are having atherosclerotic heart disease, we need to Put them on GLP-1 receptor agonist, while those patients who have heart failure or the kidney compromise, then SGL2 receptor agonists are considered to be assigned treatment side by side with metformin. Right. This is a very important slide depicting that intensive, early intensive treatment is important to reduce the CVD consequences of the diabetes. So those patients who were provided intensive treatment within one year of diagnosing type 2 diabetes mellitus, their CVD risk was reduced significantly, while those patients whose HbA1c remained more than 7% and they didn't receive intensive diabetic therapy at five years, their significant their CVD risks were significantly increased. They tend to develop myocardial infarction, more than 67% compared to non-diabetic population. The stroke, almost 50%, and heart failure, and 
Almost 64% of the patients were developing heart failure, while the composite risk of cardiovascular events were more than 62%. Yeah, this just showing that how vigilantly international opinion makers are looking into diabetes during the past eight, nine years, and so many guidelines have come up to look after these patients. Uh, just talk about another group of medication which has come up very recently. It's a combination of GIP and GLP-1. Both are the incretin hormones and they tend to they release from the gut mucosa in response to the food intake and stimulate the release of insulin from the beta cell of the pancreas. So terzepatite is a newer agent, which is more potent than the GLP-1 because it has both components of incretin hormones and they cause HbA1c reduction of in the range of almost 1.5 to 2. And they tend to provide weight reduction in the range of almost 16 to 18 kilogram over the course of five months, which is as good as gastric bypass surgery. And there is also a discussion about development of weekly insulin, which is going to be wonderful because the patient is going to have only once weekly injections. I don't have time to go into the so just I will try to wind up. This is a quote from a very great physician, which was Canadian born, but, but worked in United Kingdom in Oxford mainly, and was one of the greatest hematologists and team leader of a team which uh, discovered the platelet in early 90s. He says that good physician treat the disease but the great physician need to treat person as a whole. So we need to decide what we want to be. So the top tip, getting the things right for the patients. So early intensive control, as I mentioned, is very important in newly diagnosed younger patients. The three key messages to take home is Individualize the HbA1c target for the patient. The blood pressure control need to be optimal and the LDL cholesterol and BMI need to be looked into. We have to provide individualized treatment plan for every patient and consider earlier combination of medication rather, rather than hydrating. We don't need to be just glucocentric looking to, into reduction reducing the hyperglycemia, but the major effect need to be CVD reduction. So the priorities for the cardiovascular outcome is to treat the blood pressure, then control the lipid profile of the patient, and that the third priority is the diabetes control. Just think about reducing the CVD risk and providing better outcome from that point of view. And rather than providing just glycemic control, we need to be more vigilant in controlling the blood pressure and the lipid profile. I'm sorry, I need to rush in the end because of the time. I can thank you very much for listening to me and I'm ready to take any questions. If Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and elaborate account of uh, update on the type two diabetes mellitus. Let me begin with my uh, question. And I think we have few questions in the chat as well and others can start putting their questions yes. or can open their mic and can ask direct. So my question is how has technology such as continuous glucose monitoring evolve to benefit patients of diabetes? Yeah, actually, uh, 
of course we had only 40 minutes 50 40 50 minutes to discuss everything this is one of the most aspect of dwt scare internationally right now and continuous glucose monitoring is basically the one of the cornerstone for the last maybe uh, five years especially in the third world countries where patients are provided with some gadgets where the uh, glucose is being monitored around the clock and of course uh, it helps providing them more effective care providing the hypoglycemia and of course it look after the CBD risk of the patient and look after the kidneys better way. Uh, if I may ask Dr. Ali sir, if he can open his mic and ask the two questions he has put on the sure. chat. Hi, Dr. sir. Hello. Yes, Dr. sir, you can go ahead. Please ask your question. I think he's probably not able. Let me put his questions. What if, <clears throat> he says, what if any is the role of acrobose use? Yeah, acrobose is one of the, uh, it, 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 it used to be used uh, long back. It is still being used very rarely. The issue is it, uh, the metformin is the you know main issue of the treatment and it has some uh, gi related side effects and what acrobose do is basically it uh, bind the you know glucose and the other uh, base products of the metabolism and causes fullness and diarrhea vomiting and patient doesn't like to take it but it still it is it, it used to help patient reduce the weight and the glycemic control is quite okay with that. And uh, I rarely use it, but if the patient's glycemic control is not optimized and they are still carrying extra weight on their system, then I use and it helps basically. But the, uh, the uh, reduction in the HbA1c is very, very minimal with that, the range of anything between 2 to 0.2 to 0.4%, not more than that. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I may ask Professor Shabizadi, if you can ask your question, sir. Right. Uh, excellent talk, Ali Mumtaz. A very important topic. Uh, I have uh, one comment and one question. These days, the TV is showing a lot of uh, programs about South Asian dietary management and yeah. preventive strategy. What is all that about? Actually, the issue is, you know, uh, I'm not sure uh, if you remember uh, the, you know, one of the uh, saying of Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, he mentioned, you know, uh, for this is mainly for South Asia, for, uh, for the Arab world and South Asians, basically, that's what I felt. That if you right. want to eat, you need to divide your stomach into three portions. One is food, one is water, and one is air. So if we follow that policy, then of course uh, we look after uh, ourselves very well. There is hardly any risk of developing type two diabetes mellitus or CVD risk. There is a study called uh, uh, mm -hmm, I forget the name now. I was part of it basically a few years ago. It's called Thrifty Gene Syndrome. Thrifty Gene Syndrome. What happens is if the patients, Asian people, if, if they tend to eat less, like Imam Ali Islam mentioned. Then their genes are tend to be very very healthy and they can deal with any problem any issue and they they used to work very hard. But when we are starting more than what very normally suggested and their stomach is becoming full, then there is development of thrifty genes and they, they switch over to the bad genes resulting in in case of the type two diabetes mellitus, central obesity, and metabolic syndrome resulting in. Uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia, and of course, increasing the CVD risk. For these patients, you know, of course, they are pro prone to develop metabolic syndrome as well. So NHS is trying very hard to look into uh, these uh, uh, these group of patients. I'm not sure whether you are aware. There's a uh, in London. There's a 
area called Tower Hamlet, where Bangladeshi population is mainly there, and the diabetes risk is almost the diabetes prevalence is almost 55 percent there because of their lifestyle and their eating habits. So they are looking into these sort of patients and they are offering them you know, screening early on. And I'm not sure whether if you heard the NHS uh, program, which is uh, NHS Health Check at the age of age 40. The patients are being invited by the GPs and they tend to look into their height, weight, blood pressure, and, uh, and the sugar. And then if they are picked up having high risk, then they are referred into another program called Diabetes Prevention Program, NDPP. And they try to help them understand the various suspects and reduce the weight and manage the type 2 diabetes mellitus, if at all they are developing. So NHS is very vigilant in looking into that. They are providing early detection in the form of NHS health checks, especially to the Asian population. And I'm not sure whether you are aware, there's a South Asian diabetes uh, forum also there, and they also tend to provide uh, support to the GPs and the healthcare professional looking after South Asian population. Thank you. The other thing is, uh, is there is uh, any Asian version of Atkinson diet, the uh, common diet uh, advice that GPs give diabetic patients? Basically, you know, the uh, the NDPP, they are advising South Asian population to to avoid the you know uh, chapatis and the rice as much as they can, and the the universal formula of uh, increase you know having the three healthy diet portions of the fruits and veg five uh, portions of the fruit and vegetable is mainstay of the treatment for the South Asian population. So that's what the NHS is recommending. But uh, of course, I agree with you that they need to be more vigilant in providing appropriate care because. Uh, wherever the uh, Asian population is, the, uh, uh, the diabetes is more prevalent. I'm not sure if you are aware, in, I've come across a, a study uh, back in Pakistan a few months ago, and I noticed that, you know, the, in, the prevalence of diabetes is almost 32% in Pakistan, basically, even more mm -hmm. than the uh, Arab population, where we, we were thinking they are... Uh, they are having diabetes prevalence more than us, but basically they are almost 10 to 15 to 15 percent, and Pakistan it is almost 30 percent. Similar in uh, India as well. Thank you. Uh, I think that is all. We don't have any more questions. It was such a wonderful talk and an update. Thank you so much for giving us time and hope we will have a similar session maybe uh, early next year. Sure, inshallah, definitely. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for Thank joining you. today's session. All the best. And Thank good you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.